From time to time on the podcast, I like to share things that I find in old coaching books. And I think those are some of the most detailed resources you can find on football. We're definitely video driven in the game today in how we learn the game and really in the resources that are put together. You don't see a ton of books being written anymore and and those that are written certainly don't have the level of detail of things I've seen from Woody Hayes or Daryl Royal or Bear Bryant or in the case of what I'm going to share today, Newt Rockney. The other thing I've found though is that without looking at the plays they put into these books, what they're writing about how an offense should attack and the different aspects of offense that are important, I think It applies as much today as it did back then. So today I'm sharing chapter four of Newt Rockne's book simply called Coaching, which was published in 1925. And this chapter is about offense. And as I said, I think you're going to find a lot of things that are as applicable today as they were in the 1920s. So he starts, there is always a doubt in the minds of coaches as to which is the more important, offense or defense. Both are important, but I do believe it wise for a team to pay more attention to offense. In case you have an early game with a rugged opponent, your defense may stop them dead. However, in the second half with the score nothing to nothing, there may be a fumble and one of the opponents may run a long distance for a touchdown and kick goal. The score would then stand 7 to nothing against you, and the thing you would have to call upon under these conditions would be the offense. If you only have a defense, you would now be helpless. For that reason, I always pay a little more attention to offense than defense, as it is more difficult to get results. Offense involves more finesse and timing, judgment, and more complex team play. In general, I agree with this. Having been a head coach... Eventually, I became more offensive focused. I did coach both sides of the ball early on, but I knew that when we would look at our opponent and what we needed to do and their strengths as well as weaknesses and our strengths and weaknesses, I knew I could hide some things we were deficient in on the offensive side of the ball. But really, your defense, if it's deficient, if it has areas of weakness, those things are wide open, and a lot of times the, the offense will find and attack those. So you do have to have a good offense. You have to score points. Of course, you want to play great defense, but I think that's wise here and what, what coach recommends in paying a little bit more attention to the offense. This next part, he talks about football and warfare, and we are going into a Memorial Day weekend which honors those who have given their lives in battle for us. And I know all the time our game has that imagery. But I think Newt is correct in pointing out that football, while it may have things that are similar, is really nothing like war. It's a game. So we certainly want to give honor to those who have given their lives. And I know we do. We hold that important, really, in our coaching community, what the military has done for our country. So he starts, some coaches like to compare football to warfare and they liken the offensive team to the attacking army. They say that the line of scrimmage can be used as artillery or as infantry and that the quarterback is the chief of staff and all that goes with the chief of staff. The backfield may be likened to the cavalry or an airplane squadron. On the defensive side, the defensive line may also be called the infantry or artillery. The defensive backs may be either cavalry, bayonet men, or or anti-aircraft men, depending on your style of attack the offensive team is using. Quite a few of our moves are also very analogous to maneuvers used in Army warfare, and I will admit there is quite an analogy. However, there is a very serious difference. Warfare is a very serious thing in which thousands of lives are involved and also the defense of a country. An Army, therefore, in warfare can afford to take but few chances, and men should play it very safely so as to conserve human life and to stay in existence for the defense of their country. However, football is just a game. In case one team scores a touchdown, there's nothing lost, and there's nothing to prevent the other team from coming along and scoring two touchdowns. In warfare, if a man's life is lost, and if the entire army is destroyed, it is all over. In football, however, a touchdown may merely be the means of spurring on the other team to coming back with enough punch to still 
win the game. Then he talks about versatility of attack. To have complete versatility of attack in football means that a team must be grounded in all branches of offense. It must be able to take advantage of any weakness shown by the defense anywhere, and it must be able to gain ground against any type of defense under any conditions. 10 or 12 plays well learned will give a team a much better offense than 40 or 50 plays half learned. I don't believe any team can use more than 30 plays and have perfection in execution. There are a lot of formations used in football, but I don't believe I would use a formation unless I could use all four methods of offense from it. These four methods of offense are thrust, flank, kick, and forward pass. And then he explains these. Thrust, between two defensive tackles, flank, outside the defensive tackles, kick, place kick, drop kick, punt, or surprise kick, which was a big part of offense back then, more related to the rugby type of game where at any point you could kick the ball and used to happen on early downs a little more. Of course, we're going to take every bit of what we have to uh, move the ball forward before we punt on fourth down now or go for it. Forward pass, any kind of play wherein the ball is thrown forward to a teammate. We can divide all kinds of formations into four kinds. Any formation you can think of can be classified under one of the following divisions. A close formation. Quarterback handling the ball ends in close, backs in close. This formation uses thrust plays. Open formation. Direct pass ends flanking tackle uh, backs a little wider apart. Stresses flank plays. Punt formation, that's self-explanatory, it's for the kick, and then spread formation. Now what's interesting as he draws these up are some plays, you know, single wing type of plays. Uh, Definitely you see how eventually those became maybe the I formation or the wing T. But the spread formation that he shows is very close to the spread formation of today. In fact, it looks like a bunch trips uh, in this particular one. Now, Uh, Certainly, there were a lot of different ways they attacked, and you look at it and how the the quarterback was drawn or where, and they might even call that player the tailback at the time, is looks like about seven yards deep. And uh, again, that was more of the punt kick formation. So uh, while he's saying that, though, definitely similarities to what we're talking about today. Your plays in a regular attack must have all of the following qualities. All plays, including fakes, must be strong plays in themselves. Deception alone is not enough. Again, execution there, right? You want to be able to execute a play. Uh, It's not about deception. On forward pass plays, the ball must never be thrown at a dangerous angle. We hear that all the time, right? Don't don't throw late across the middle as an example. Uh, So he was focused on some of those things back then. The play must fit within a sequence of plays from the formation. The success of a good play, as far as the offense is concerned, will depend upon superiority of the line charge and interference. In other words, you want to have a great offensive line and be able to block. Fast starting and getting to the point of attack fast. Proper timing and every assignment fulfilled by all the 11 men. He goes into balanced versus unbalanced line here. And I know unbalanced has definitely made a comeback. You start to see more teams using it. And I think he has some insight here into why you used unbalanced. Some coaches prefer the balanced line and other coaches prefer the unbalanced line as follows. The unbalanced line gives the offensive team a powerful attack behind the four linemen on one side of the center. The center is not a good point to hit, of course, because the snapper is too engrossed in passing the ball accurately to be able to charge effectively. The unbalanced line, however, is not quite so strong outside of the tackle, nor is it so strong on the weak side. The balanced line has not as much strength driving from the strong side. This is compensated for, however, because it has more strength outside of tackle and back on the weak side. I would say, generally speaking, to use the unbalanced line if you have driving backs and the balanced line if you have shifty backs. That makes sense, right? If you have more of a power type runner, using an unbalanced line, getting combos, letting him drive through the line of scrimmage uh, works very well for the unbalanced as compared to uh, some of those running backs maybe who are looking for and being more type of zone runners. The shift attack. I know when you look at it, there was a time when motion um, was very basic 
as we went to 10 personnel spread. You know, it was line up in two by two and three by one. Every now and then you're going to motion a guy across. Maybe you motion the back out of the backfield or flip him to the other side. Um, but there was really not a lot in terms of shifting because inside the box, uh, there, there's nothing to be gained by uh, moving people around. Uh, you might flip the back to the other side, but shifting strength, et cetera, is not capable in the spread. So you see more teams going to 11 personnel, 12 personnel, even 21 personnel, and now shifts and motions can become very effective. I think it was uh, when the 49ers were in the Super Bowl, um, I don't know if that was like four or five years back, they were one of the teams who used, or they were the team who used the most shifting in motion. I want to say it was on 73% of their plays, and it made them highly effective. And uh, when I think about what Coach Rockney says here, it reminds me of all those things that they were doing. So coaches are also divided on the set formation as compared to the shift attack. The coach who uses set formation and say it gives the quarterback a better chance to look over the defense, and therefore he can be more certain as to whether or not a play will work than he can in the case of the shift attack. However, I will not admit this. If the defensive tackles, center, and fullback all keep moving around as the quarterbacks keeps calling his numbers, and I know, remember back then the, it was a little bit more mirrored in what we were calling uh, the offensive side and the defensive side of the ball. So they would call their nose a center. Uh, they would call their linebackers fullbacks as well. So I'll, I'll go back to the beginning of that sentence. If the defensive tackle, center, and fullback keep moving around as the quarterback keeps calling his number, the offensive quarterback will have to do a lot of guessing, even on a set formation. Furthermore, the defensive team has a long time to look over your di- different backs and can unconsciously, probably at least one or two of them, will point or tip off the play. Of course, teams are coached to guard against this, but even the best of men will sometimes do it. In the case of a shift attack, I mean this by a team which shifts only the backfield and the backfield shifts and is stationary for a moment. Then they are off again before the defense has uh, time to look over and pick up any tipping signs or mannerisms. The offensive end can tell the quarterback how the tackle is shifting. The offensive tackle can tell the guards are shifting and the offensive guards can tell whether or not the center is staying in or pulling out. The offensive hat halfback can tell whether or not the ends are coming in tight or playing square. With this in mind, the offensive quarterback, by keeping his eye on the secondary and the tertiary defense, can get just as definite definite a point of view of how the defense is placed as the quarterback in the set formation. Furthermore, their shift should be so fast that the defense does not have does not quite have enough time to be able to analyze whether you have a square formation, Z formation, or V formation, whether or not it is going to be a direct or indirect pass. If the defense is not sure on these points, it is handicapped. Contrary to the opinion held in some circles, the shift is used only for deception and not for momentum. I do not believe in the line shift as it adds very little to the deception and instead just merely tires out the big heavy linemen who are unfit physically for the fast, dexterous movements of the shift. In order to be successful, a backfield using the shift must be nimble, rhythmical, and coordinately light on their feet. If I had a big plunging backfield uh, which was clumsy and could not shift with grace, I would use a set offense. I have talked to hundreds of coaches as to which they would rather play defense against the set or the shift. And almost unanimously, they have said that the set offense is easier to meet. I use a shift offense whenever I can. On the shift offense, two counts should be spent in the position after the shift so as to ensure no momentum. In other words, get set before the ball is snapped. So he talks about a couple things there. Uh, He makes mention of the offensive lineman shifting. And so um, back at that time, quite a bit, you'd see the offensive line shift. I want to say I was watching Stanford uh, some years back, and they had a a really cool shift. I know we did it uh, in one of our games, but they had uh, everybody moving. The offensive line, I think they moved like four times. So those are things you would see. Back in the 1920s, I know when I was at BW, we replicated it, and our our linemen loved that one. I I can't even remember what we called it, but we did it once in a game, and it was kind of funny. People hadn't seen anything, 
And, you know, as as we're lining up for the snap, it was kind of quiet in the stadium. And, and about the fourth time we or the third time we moved to our last set, uh, everybody kind of started, you know, giggling about and meaning the fans about what was going on because you just don't see that. So that used to be part of it. But I think everything else he says here and moving what he says are the backs. Now, that's including fullbacks and H-back types of players in what would be a modern offense. Uh, those guys have to move quickly. You know, a shift that doesn't move quickly kind of is wasted. You need to really move. I know it's something we always emphasized when we talked about shifts or double moves or even motion, right? You had to, didn't have to necessarily sprint, but you needed to be on the run. You didn't want to be a jog or a walk. So I know if you're doing a shift and you see your guys being slow about it, you want to speed them up. Now, one thing that can work if you're putting in shifts and motions is to have, and it could be through a walkthrough, but a shift and motion period where you're getting everybody to the right place. Um, You're ensuring that if you are moving in uh, uh, the lines in a shift and then motioning somebody that there's set amount of time, I think it's great to practice that in a period by itself. But again, the point he's making here with a set offensive formation versus the shift, back then in the 1920s, every defensive coach was saying, I'd rather see the set formation. And I think that's true today. You know, the one disadvantage you have in a no huddle is they always see your formation. They see you lining up in it. But when you huddle and come out of it, um, you can start to move guys. And now it becomes very difficult. He actually speaks about that a little bit here later. Now he does spend a section where he diagrams some plays and how he explains how he's attacking at different points uh, across the offense. I'm going to skip ahead to the end of that where he says, it will be noticed that various plays off of each of the three sequences resemble each other more or less, which probably has caused some coaches to make the remark that there are only seven plays in football and that every play, except of course a trick play, is one of the seven, and that whatever difference there is is merely a fact of embellishment. Fundamentally, they have practically everything in common. However, the little details used in dressing up plays are themselves very, very important. In fact, in offensive football, Every little minute detail must be accurate and duly stressed. The poor football coach takes everything for granted, while the good football coach takes nothing for granted. So uh, I I 100% believe that's true. And, you know, there was a a point, I remember telling a coach this one time, you know, when I would go out and scout and just watch a Friday night game, go stand on the sidelines, you'd see two teams sometimes almost with identical plays. But one team was coaching the details and executing the details and paying attention to detail where the other wasn't, and that made all the difference. So uh, his point there certainly is something that's held true over time. The huddle system. So back at this time, uh, the huddle was not something that was really a big part of football, and it started to come into play around this time. Um what you saw pretty much was up tempo. I have old film and I know I've used some in an article before where uh, I was watching uh, this college game and the balls spotted and within four seconds, they're off and and running another play again. And I was really interested into how the heck are they communicating things that fast? Uh, Obviously you don't have anything like we do now where the official will come and stand over the ball. Uh, Basically you saw the player putting the ball down Uh, The ref would come over for one second, get out of the way, and they'd go. Uh, So huddle wasn't a big thing back then. So he talks about huddle here, though, as he sees some of the advantages to it. There's been much discussion about the huddle system on offense, or as it is sometimes called, the ring around the rosy. The use of this was brought about by the fact that in a large stadium with a tremendously large crowd, it was sometimes difficult for all the offense to hear the quarterback's signals. If correctly used, it was also a strategic importance. Running out from the huddle, a team can line up in one of many formations and the ball may be snapped before the defense has had time to analyze the strength and weakness of this formation. The method is particularly useful when you are springing a surprise formation on a team. A team using the huddle, however, lacks the punch which it would have with a great quarterback with a wonderful voice and personality directing it. The huddle play also enables some teams to do a lot of stalling. However, if properly used, it has a lot of points in its favor. The referee has the right to stand right in the middle of the huddle and make sure that there is no stalling. 
when you look at the huddle, I know a lot of people just use that as communication. But if you go back through old playbooks and look at them, there were coaches who would spend pages on the details of how they were going to execute their huddle. The huddle was part of not just their communication, but their offensive attack and getting out of the huddle fast, aligning fast, and getting the ball snapped was really their form of tempo. Uh, I definitely see use in it today. I've, I've seen Gus Malzahn use that, where they use their sugar huddle. They're four yards from the ball. They line up quickly. Uh, it's very hard to you know get your calls out. And within, as I measured, it was usually between 3.5 and 4 seconds, including motion. The ball was snapped after they would break their huddle. So I've also seen it uh, back in, I think it was the Chris Peterson era at Boise State. I saw Boise State play Toledo on a Friday night, which we had off, we had a bye week, and we went out and watched that game, and I was just so impressed with what Boise State was doing to really run tempo out of a huddle. They would get out of their huddle so quick, their hands would hit the ground, they'd be set for a second, and usually they were moving after that. Almost every single play, there was a shift and then a motion, or at the very least, a motion. Um, a lot of times it was multiple movements, and they're forcing the defense to be wrong. I always like to say that it's three chances to be wrong when you shift or motion. You're forcing them to communicate. Uh, sorry, you're forcing them to recognize, communicate, and then make the adjustment. Those three things, three opportunities to be wrong. Someone said, no, it's 33 because there's 11 guys on the field. So regardless of whether you think it's three or 33, I am forcing the defense to do things and it can make them wrong. It can open up some opportunities for us. So just some thoughts there on using shifts and motions and using the huddle properly. I think some important things there that Coach Rockney brings out. So he finishes up with what he calls hints on offense. And he goes through and shares 12 of these. Um, I'll cover most of them. One, plays must not be over 30 in number. He talked before about being simple. Being simple, I think, is something I heard again and again from great offensive coordinators. We don't want to have too much. I think it was Phil Longo who said on the po- podcast that his his playbook at home is as tall as him. There's a lot of plays that he loves, but he cuts it down to uh, the number he uses, 26. So plays must not be over 30 in number. Plays must always have the following qualities. All plays, including fakes, must be strong plays in themselves. Deception alone is not enough. You have to be able to execute, right? You have to have the technique with it. You have to make that concept strong. Be careful on all pass plays to see that the ball is never thrown at dangerous angles. Plays must fit with a sequence of plays from the formation. He talks about formations. Formations must be from one which you can use any method of offense, thrust, flank, kick, forward, pass. He goes over the four kinds of formations which we covered before. He says the success of a good play depends on the superiority of the line, charge, and interference, fast starting and getting to the point of attack, fast timing, all assignments fulfilled by all 11 men. Do not use offense which depends for success on fooling someone. Some trick plays are all right to keep the defense guessing, but that is all. Depend on deception power and superiority in execution of fundamentals. Timing and practice in remembering assignments can be perfected by dummy scrimmage, or in other words, 11 on 11. Quick opening wedge and shoulder to shoulder turtle back crawl, not sure what that technique is, should all be used so as to get versatility. Shift plays should be fast enough so as not to permit defense either to shift fast enough to meet nor allow them to diagnose. All plays should be covered or disguised as long as possible. Do not use too many plays. A few plays well learned are better than too many not well learned. And then this last one I think is great. Be sure to exhaust all good possibilities of a formation. It is better to have only a few formations using all these possibilities than many formations with only a few plays off each. Great point there. In today's world of analytics, very easy to diagnose when you're only doing one or things out of a formation. 
And now the defense is set up to stop you. So some great insight from Newt Rockney there. Things that have stood the test of time. Remember, this is from the 1920s. And we could have put most of that in a coach's manual today or in a playbook today. So um, we'll continue. We can't get those guys on, but I I always look for uh, some of these gold nuggets, these books that I have on my shelf that really share both the history of the game as well as just some great coaching points. Have a great holiday weekend. Follow me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski and follow all we're doing at CoachAndCoordinator.com.